Hey, Clemson family, let's get into a couple of the top questions Clemson football must find answers for during this offseason. I'm Daniel Shirley. Plus, we'll talk about the first place Clemson basketball team and get ready for the big game coming up Saturday with Virginia Tech. Still first place after their first ACC loss of the year. And then we've got some interesting football stuff from listeners. We'll share that real quick as well. I'm Bill Zimmerman. We're glad you found us for episode 57 of the Reign Supreme All-Way podcast. The easy way you can keep up on all the big news around Clemson sports and our analysis of it is to smash that subscribe button, youtube.com slash Clemson kickoff, or hit follow on your favorite podcast app. Well, let's go ahead and get into a couple of the big questions for the offseason, making sure that 2023 ends better than the last couple of seasons. And Daniel, I'll let you bat lead off with that. Well, I totally have to change from where we were at this time last week because I was going to <laughs> talk about my biggest question was how Dabo Sweeney uh, responds with staff, and we saw that with the Garrett Riley hire. So uh, I'll totally go away from that. And <laughs> Thank goodness uh, maybe there won't be any changes to the coaching staff this week. Mine's going to be the defense, Bill. I, I need to see more consistency with the defense. Um, <clears throat> I'm not saying the defense was bad. I'm not saying the defense is – the only reason they lost the three games that they lost, but I didn't see progress from the defense over what we saw previously. It, it felt like this defense took a big step backwards. So um, there were there were great moments for sure. Uh, and and look, just look at the South Carolina game. I mean, the pick six to start that game was a great moment, but then after that, the defense really struggled uh, after the after they got up fourteen to nothing. The Tennessee game, I you know I thought there were times. Uh, in that game where the defense played pretty well, but then they give up a big play or the, or they, they get back into the game and give up a big play. So I thought the tackling was suspect throughout the season. Uh, I thought the, there was a lack of consistency. And then I thought there was a lack of focus as well. I mean, how many times did we talk about screen play? I mean, they can't, they, they're struggling covering the screen game against Furman. Georgia tech even moved the ball. So, uh, and then, my goodness, the the Wake Forest game. I don't know that we need to rehash that one too much. But I, I just felt like the defense just overall lacked something. And I'm not quite sure what that was. Maybe maybe you have a thought on that. Yeah, inconsistent is the word for it, I think. I mean, it, overall against Tennessee, I felt like the defense was okay, but they did give up the big plays. And the big plays really got Tennessee in the end zone. A lot of times you'd see those big plays much of the season and then they'd buckle down and, and prevent a touchdown. That certainly bit them against Tennessee. It bit them against South Carolina. They were out physical against Notre Dame. You know, I wanted to see more of that form that they showed against NC State, even when NC State had Devin Leary in the game. Uh, more of the form that they showed most of the game against Florida State, with the exception of a rough start and a rough finish to that game. They really helped make sure that Clemson controlled the vast majority of that football game wasn't as close as the final score indicated. Miami, Louisville, you know, other games where they absolutely did their jobs and did them very well, but against some of the top competition, they weren't as capable. And I hope that's going to light a fire under them this offseason to say, all right, either the coaches have to find different solutions or the players have to take the coaching uh, a little more to heart. Maybe a little bit of all involved needs to change and get addressed. You want to get back to that, all right, you know, no college defense is just going to completely smother anybody these days. It's not the way the game is built. But you've got to really contain the damage a lot better. And in recent years, Clemson had done much better than that. I don't know if it's as simple as Brent Venables leaving. I suspect it's not. You had a new defensive tackles coach in there, and Nick Eason, a little bit of change there, some new responsibilities from Mike Reed, some new responsibilities for Mickey Kahn, some different – uh, analysts behind the scenes on the on the coaching staff. We're also going to see, by all indications, off-field coaches and analysts are actually going to be able to coach players except on game day. So that's going to be something that Clemson can turn to for a little more improvement as well. And we'll see how the defense handles that in particular. Probably. I think some of that is already going on, and now it's just you can't police it, so let's let it happen. But I've, I've really felt like there were a couple of things that that kind of bugged me throughout the year with the defense. And I know you and I have texted about that. Don't show anybody the evidence. I don't think anybody needs to see that. But there was 
a lack of focus at times throughout the season, and you'd hear the coaches talk about the technique wasn't great. Okay, well, why is it not getting any better? Is it the coaching, or is it the players not taking to the coaching? Is it the coaches not being demanding enough, and the players just saying, oh, well, I can just kind of get by and do this and still be pretty good? We don't know. We're not in practice. There's no way that we can know that. So, um, and and then I thought the tackling was was really suspect throughout the season. So, those are a couple of things that I think need to improve. And then also the third one, I felt there were times, Bill, that they were too aggressive, and they would blitz too much, and and instead that you know a couple of times just sit back and and make a play. And I mean, how many times early in the season did we see? the opponents convert third and long and and where it felt like there was no reason to blitz two extra guys on that play. Just sit back in, in coverage and make the play. So that kind of stuff, I think, is a first-year defensive coach trying to find his way uh, with a new staff like you're talking about. Maybe those things improve coming up next year. Maybe the health is better. I know the health was a big problem with the defense throughout this season. I mean, guys being out, guys being banged up guys being sick, all those things. So hopefully all those things will come together a little bit better uh, in 2023. Yep, and I'll just tack one thing on the end here. I know I've mentioned it a lot. I don't want to harp on it too much. Improve the quality of tackling. Improve the quality of that first hit. Stand a guy up. You don't have to finish him off necessarily, but stand him up, break his uh, momentum enough that someone else can get there and help you bring him down without giving up another two, three yards after that initial contact. Let's see how that gets addressed as well. Be sure to check us out in between episodes on social media at Clemson Kickoff on Twitter and on Instagram. Well, my top question, Daniel, is can the hiring of Garrett Riley help the quarterbacks commit to handing the ball off more often? We've seen some of this. We've seen people allude to this all the way back to when Tony Elliott was dealing with Trevor Lawrence. We've wondered at times if Uyunga Lale wasn't giving the ball up in RPO calls as often as he should have been. And certainly we saw in that Orange Bowl, Cade Klubnick wanted to be the solution. Will Shipley and Phil Moffa combined for just 24 carries and nine passing targets together. Klubnick had 20 carries to go with 54 pass attempts overall. Now we know Garrett Riley's committed to running the ball. That's been clear, both TCU and SMU before that. By all accounts, Dabo Sweeney wants to see a running game that is central to the, quote, Clemson offense. Let's find a way to make sure it gets executed the way it ought to be. Maybe that means more dedicated run calls out of RPO formations. Maybe that means just more discipline by the quarterbacks. We would assume Klubnik will be the starter, but we'll get our first look at Christopher Vizina this year. The quotes about committing to the run need to bear fruit on the field. No doubt. I mean, how many times after games did we hear Brandon Streeter and the other offensive coaches say, yeah, we need to commit to the run. We need to get the ball to Will Shipley a little bit more. In hindsight, I mean, how many times in hindsight did we hear that through the season? Get the ball to Shipley, get the ball to Moffa more often. So that's going to be a really interesting part, I think, of just spring practice is keeping an eye on those things when we get to the spring game, finding out, you know, how that's working. But your best players have to touch the ball more often. And I mean, you told me the numbers from the Orange Bowl and they're just shocking how many times that they just put the ball in Klubnik's hand and said, go make a play. Now, how many of those times were those him making the wrong decision? We don't know. But Phil Moffa and Will Shipley need to touch the ball more than they did throughout this season. I don't think anybody would argue against that. You know, there's a little bit of a common thread here, maybe between your point about the defense and, and my point about the running game. It takes a supremely confident athlete to be at a top level in Power 5 football, in the NFL, major leagues, NBA, college basketball, you name it. If you want to be at the top of your sport, you have to have a ton of confidence. But I think you also then have to have that awareness of, hey, there's there's a good aspect of wanting to put the team on your back and do it all yourself, but it only gets more difficult if you don't involve the talent that's around you. I, I think there needs to be an awareness by Klubnik that probably the two best players on the field when Clemson has the ball are Will Shipley and Phil Maffa. I think Klubnik has to have an awareness 
to go with that confidence that he can get on the field and lead the team, but also realize that probably the two best players, or at least two of the three best players when Clemson has the ball, Will Shipley and Phil Maffa. Uh, yeah, you want to get the ball to Antonio Williams. Yeah, you want to get the tight ends involved. You want to throw over the middle. I know there's a certain truth to having to shoot your way out of a slump, so to speak, to borrow a basketball term. But when you have the ability to run the ball, especially against South Carolina, Uyunglele throwing the ball every which direction, when the run game was working so well against that defense, force the run. Assert yourself as a coach. Make certain that the ball is getting into your ball carrier's hands. And I would say the reverse. If the run wasn't working and you've got a couple of possession receivers, you've got to force the ball to them. What we saw this past year was an inability to commit to the run for whatever reason, and hopefully Garrett Rowley bringing new perspective to the room is going to fix that. I, I hope so, and I think so. I, it feels like the best quarterbacks are almost like a point guard, right? Get the ball out of your hands quickly, get it to your playmakers, and let them do the damage. And, and look, that's not always going to be the case. There are going to be plays where the quarterback needs to keep and and on an RPO and and get around the end. That's great. That's fine. That's part of the offense. But that you can't ignore the running backs. And it felt like they did a lot of the season. And, you know, we'll see how that plays out. And I can't wait to see what that looks like in the spring. You can find all our episodes at our homepage, Clemson Kickoff. You can scroll down. It's like an archive. Some other useful links there as well. And we'll be sure to post the schedule there once it's released January 30th. Let's get into a quick conversation of sorts that developed on our YouTube page in the comments. It was in our most recent episode about Garrett Riley getting hired. Uh, a good point that I think we made in our short episode, but probably unfairly glossed over it. And that's on us. At BWW1267, fortunately added in the comments, I'm sorry for Streeter and his family. He's a good coach. Uh, but not top five in offensive coordinator in the nation, and Clemson's talent deserves a top coordinator. Uh, started some other folks saying, yes, it would have been nice to see him stick around as an analyst, and whether or not that was really practical or would it be seen really as too much of a demotion for him to stay. Uh, at the truth, 7739, got back to the original point. Uh, he's such a genuine guy. I hope him and his family are all right. He's been in it for a long time. Uh, you pointed out, Daniel, that uh, Streeter's a Clemson graduate. You hate to see that happen to a fellow grad, but it probably did need to happen just, you know, results-wise, I would imagine, uh, as you and I discussed quite a bit in that episode. And then, obviously, that he's going to collect quite a bit of money for the remainder of his contract. It is kind of rough, though, to see the personal side of that move, and you hope that Garrett Riley's going to fit in well, bring a good aura to the room and really fit, as Dabo Sweeney loves to say, the culture. Isn't that why the decision was so surprising? You know, Streeter's not an outsider. He's a Clemson guy. And that's why I was so shocked that the decision was actually made because it felt like it went away from the culture that you're talking about, the Clemson family. But Dabo has made these tough decisions before when he's had to. And he it looks like he felt like he had to make this decision. They improved some on offense this year. There's no doubt about that. But they really struggled in yards per play, which is a big metric that a lot of people look at. They weren't good in that. They were in the 90s nationally in yards per play. So that has to improve, and hopefully Garrett can can get that done. And we'll see what he brings to the team. I, again, I'm really interested to see what kind of new schemes he brings and how he wants to use those two running backs. Uh, I think is going to be key. And then, Bill, we also don't know either what the new pieces bring in, the new signees, uh, the freshmen, what they add to this offense, because there might be another Antonio Williams in this group who could really help this offense take it to the next level. And along those same lines, I'll be interested to see uh, what's in store for Brandon Streeter next year. Uh, will he take a gap year? Will he latch on somewhere and contribute to another offensive attack? And, of course, as that unfolds, as we hear things, we'll be sure to mention it as well. Be sure to smash that subscribe button, youtube.com slash Clemson kickoff. It's an easy way to help ensure that we can keep this a free podcast for everyone and you won't miss out on analysis of the latest. Let's get into basketball. Uh, I probably jinxed everything by getting all excited about basketball, as happens to me so many years with Clemson. I apologize to everybody. 
This time it manifested in not only a loss to Wake Forest, but a couple of injuries that you don't want to make excuses. You've got to overcome them. Uh, Chase Hunter and Alex Hemingway both missing from the backcourt, and that gives Brad Brownell a real puzzle that he's got to solve in order to keep this team on track. I thought the the Hunter injury was really big. And, and look, they've played without him and Way for a couple of weeks now. So they're figuring that out. They've gone with a bigger lineup. That has helped. They weren't going to go 20-0. and 0, So let's don't make this out to be more than it is. But the, the Hunter injury is huge. And hopefully he'll be back Saturday. Sounds like he could be um, possibly back to playing Saturday against Virginia Tech. If they can get him back, then that slides everybody back down a slot, and you have that veteran leadership at the point guard slot. I thought Josh Beadle and and Dylan Hunter played okay on Tuesday night. I don't think the reason they lost was because of that specifically, but I thought the defensive problems were there. Chase helps with that, and I think having him back will straighten out a lot of the things that we saw Tuesday night in that game against Wake Forest. And again, you have to credit Wake Forest. Wake Forest is a really good team, especially at home, especially offensively, and you saw that in the game Tuesday night. The ACC also needs to solve these games being watchable on streaming services that people pay for, including myself. Hopefully that gets ironed out in the offseason. It was pretty shameful that this game went off the air even with time left on the clock and still happening. So you hope that gets worked out. Virginia Tech certainly becomes a more imposing challenge than if this team was 100%. And what could have been sort of a softer portion of the schedule now hopefully is a building experience, I think, for the Tigers and gives some of these other backcourt guys uh, a chance to emerge, a chance to get their sea legs under them, as I say from time to time. You don't want to rush Chase Hunter back sooner than you need him. And you hope these other guys can contribute in a meaningful way and allow Hunter to really get to 100% in time for the stretch run. For sure. And look, I mean, you look at the schedule coming up again, Virginia Tech on Saturday, that's a winnable game. Georgia Tech at home on Tuesday, that's a winnable game. You probably could win both of those games without Chase playing. Let's hope he's healthy enough to play. But like you said, don't force him back. Then there's two road games. And again, winning in the, on the road in the ACC is not easy. But you go to Florida State, they're not having their typical kind of year. Boston College is a winnable game on the road. So these next four, you could probably see them going three and one if Chase doesn't play. So we'll see how he is with his health. And then things get a little bit tougher down the stretch with Virginia and Miami and North Carolina still on the schedule. But they're in NC State playing in in Raleigh has improved a lot through this season as well. But it feels like this team could still go on a deep run here. uh, And I think a lot of that depends on how healthy they can stay. But P.J. Hall's playing better. He looks healthy or getting close to being himself. Uh, But if they're healthy, I think they've got a chance to do some damage here coming up the second half of the season. Yeah, all, all of my self-effacing humor aside, I am excited. I'm, I, I do think that there's a lot of promise in this team and a pleasant surprise to see how well they're playing. And I hope they are going to navigate these rough waters and look really good as we approach March Madness. It's going to be here closer than we think. I also want to say thanks real quick to the tens of thousands of people who have listened to us. We've now passed 75,000 listens combined between YouTube and the podcast apps. Really appreciate it. And in our upcoming episodes, we're going to start a series on position by position previews, uh, sort of look back at what the 2022 season brought across the field and what we might be watching for as spring ball approaches. Well, until our next episode, I'm Bill Zimmerman. I'm Daniel Shirley. Go Tigers.